Hello, everyone, and welcome to Kingston Writers Fest. Uh, we're just going to give Zoom a second to pull everyone in here. Uh, my name is Trisha Knowles. I've been the Director of Marketing and Event Sponsorship with Kingston Writers Fest for the past five years. And for the five years prior to that, a very eager volunteer. So I'm very, very pleased to welcome you to this new platform to present our first virtual version of Kingston Writers Fest and this afternoon's event. Hashtag Me Too, Reclaiming Women's Power by Outing Rape Culture. While we are gathering here this afternoon online rather than in person, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge that the land in which the board and the staff of Kingston Writers Fest gather to create and generate this online presentation is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee's people. We gratefully acknowledge these Indigenous nations for their outgoing guardianship of this land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility for stewardship of this land, its waters, and all of its biodiversity. All those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring these relationships in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. Shimigwich Welalin. Thank you for being here. Speaking of thank yous, we are very grateful to those organizations and individuals who support the festival. Kingston Writers Fest would especially like to thank Sarah Aerosmith, author patron of Robin Doolittle, and Book Clubs United from Kingston, author patrons of Daniel Young Ullman. Canada Council, GG Books, Heritage Canada, Ontario Arts Council, the City of Kingston, and the Kingston Arts Council. Also, special thanks to Tourism Kingston for their ongoing support of our marketing initiatives. And thank you too, to all of you who have donated to the festival. Couple housekeeping notes before I introduce the lovely moderator for today. This event is 45 minutes long. It will include a brief question and answer period. And you can tell us where you're from using the Zoom Q&A tab on your screen. Don't be alarmed if your chat doesn't work, it's the Q&A tab you want to hit. This is also the place where you can post your questions for Robin and Danielle. Finally, we invite you to visit writersfest.ca to complete an online survey. This gives you the chance to win a pass to next year's festival, or if you are very, very far away, a lovely selection of books from this year's authors. Now I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Y.S. Lee. Ying is an alumna of Kingston Writers Fest, bursting onto the YA scene with a gripping new mystery series, The Agency. The first two books have been translated into seven languages and shortlisted for the Agatha Award on the Ontario Library Association's Red Maple Award. A Spy in the House won the inaugural John Spray Mystery Award for Young People. And with a PhD in Victorian literature and culture, she really draws on her academic expertise to create the backdrops for her novels. She also creates strong and sometimes scrappy female characters. Her heroine in the novel series I mentioned, Mary Quinn, is an orphan, a thief, and an ever undercover agent in 1850s London in all its grime and glory. Her story in plain sight takes place at the Kingston Penitentiary in the 1880s, has been called, quote, particularly noteworthy, tackling as it does female agency. The legendary Garrett Girls is about a pair of barkeep sisters scrambling to outwit legendary real life con man Soapy Smith in Gold Rush, Alaska. And 12 Sisters, her brilliant sequel to the Grimm Brothers fairy tale, The Twelve Dancing Princesses, and my personal favorite, is the story of what happened after the random soldier married the princess and coincidentally turned out to be, and I quote again, a complete bastard. To lead today's conversation on the need to reclaim women's power by outing rape culture, please welcome Y.S. Lee. Thank you so much for that beautiful introduction, Trisha. Um, I'm here to um, introduce your authors for the day, um, Danielle young Alman and also Robin Doolittle. Uh, Danielle young Alman is a critically acclaimed novelist and playwright who came to literature by way of acting. She says, I quote, 
Theater is studying the human condition, life, storytelling. Everything you do as an actor to get into the skin of a character and to interpret the intentions of the playwright and then the director, all of that is extremely useful to the writing process." End quote. Danielle's novel, Everything Beautiful is Not Ruined, was shortlisted for the Governor General's Award for Literature in the Young People's Category and the Canadian Children Book Center's Amy Mathers Award. Danielle's newest book, which is here, it's called He Must Like You, is a smart, fierce, and subtle exploration of consent, and as many have said, a must read. Um, we are so thrilled to welcome you to Kingston Writers Fest, Danielle. Thank you. Oh, hang on, I'll start my video. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction. I'm very thrilled to be here. And um, I think we're starting with a bit of a read. Um, so I'm gonna do that. I will just set it up. Normally I read from um, just right at the beginning of the book, but because of today's subject matter, I'm going to start with chapter six in which my character Libby is waking up. Uh, well, she's not really waking up, she's awake. Um, and it is the morning of uh, an encounter, a hookup that has gone kind of not where she expected it to. And um, so I just thought I would read a bit of that. And then I'm just going to jump forward to uh, something that happens a bit later and it all fits in five minutes. So I'll go for that um, after this. So first of all, uh, chapter six, Naked in the Driveway. The next thing I know, I'm trapped under Kyle's arm, watching him sleep. I can barely breathe. It's the weight of his arm, I figure, or maybe the smell of him, the now stale beer on his breath, the sweat, a whiff of restaurant mixed with day-old cologne. And I am so thoroughly disgusted with myself. I pry his arm off me, escape from the bed without waking him, grab some clothes from the pile on top of my dresser, and make a beeline for my never-been-renovated, genuine vintage, mint green and peach-colored bathroom. Once inside, I lock the door, brush my teeth, and take the kind of shower that would have my dad pounding on the door and threatening to turn the water off if he were home. Finally, I get out, wrap myself in a bath sheet, and stare at my foggy outline in the mirror. I feel scorched and soiled, and I hate what I see there. Someone who let that happen after saying it wasn't going to happen. Someone who didn't even put up a fight. Still, it's over. I put on deodorant, get dressed in sweats and a t-shirt, and stick my hair up into a messy bun. Not wanting to be anywhere near Kyle, I head down to the basement with garbage and recycling bags to clean up. It doesn't take long, and soon I'm outside the kitchen door, shoving the garbage into the garbage cans and the empty bottles into our neighbor's recycling bin, crossing my fingers that they won't notice the addition. Then my eyes fasten on Kyle's truck, sitting conspicuously in the driveway. Crap. The early birds are starting to chirp, and soon it'll be light. I need Kyle out of here, now. I rush back inside to wake him, but he won't budge. I try poking him, rolling him, saying his name, but all that happens is he jams himself into the corner and throws an arm over his face. I need help. Emma only got back from vacation yesterday and it's an insane time to call anyone, but I go to the front hall and grab my phone anyway. There's precedent for this. I went to her house in the middle of the night twice last year to help when she was having a panic attack and didn't want to wake her parents. And we have always promised to be there for one another, no questions asked. Well, she will have questions, but I hope she'll save most of them for later. I hit call, wait for the, while the phone rings once, then I hang up and dial again, knowing her do not disturb setting lets the second call through. I'm just about to give up when she answers. Libby, she answers groggily, what's wrong? My parents went out of town overnight and I sort of accidentally had a small party with some of my coworkers. Uh-oh, is your house trashed? No, but there's a boy in my bed. She whistles, you devil, what boy? Just someone from work. He didn't think he could drive, so I let him have sex with me. WTF. Uh, crash here, but I need him out of here in case my parents come back early or the parents notice his giant truck in the driveway, but he is dead to the world. Is he breathing? Dead to the world, M. Not actually dead. I'll be there in five. True to her word, Emma arrives on foot five minutes later. She looks far more alert and put together than seems fair, dressed in cute, color-coordinated tennis wear. Her cheeks, uh, sorry, her eyes, her cheeks are not snapping. Uh, her eyes snapping with curiosity and only a pillow crease on her cheek giving any hint that she was fast asleep 10 minutes ago. How drunk was she, was he, she whispers as we head down the hallway toward my room. Drunk but capable, I say, and then feel myself flush and rush to add, like not stumbling around or passing out. Will he be safe to drive? 
I think so. Do you have his keys? They're probably in his pants pocket. Hang on. I creep into my room, grab his pants from the floor, and drag them back into the hallway. Emma's eyes widen. You didn't mention he wasn't wearing them. Um, yeah. Uh, I focus hard on the pants, give them a shake, and then hear something that jingles like keys. I guess I should probably warn you he's not dressed. You mean he's naked? Uh, well, last time I looked, he had the covers pulled up to his chest. Emma snorts and I try to shush her. I'm sorry, she says, trying to stifle her laughter. It's just the look on your face. I start to laugh too, but it turns into more of a shiver and Emma's amusement evaporates. Hey, whoa, Libby, are you okay? I'm fine, I say, holding the pants away from my body and trying not to look at them. I'll be fine once he's out of here. Okay, let's get it done then. Okay, and then I'm just gonna skip forward a few days after this has happened, uh, someone comes and gives a presentation about consent at Libby's high school. And in this presentation, uh, she hears a lot of things that enlighten how she's been feeling about this situation she was just in with her coworker and also some of the other things that have happened in her short life, sadly. Um, so this is just the, at the end of the presentation. The very second the presentation is over, I leap to my feet, cut through the crowd, and make a beeline for the gym doors, escaping before anyone else has even really moved. I zoom through the entrance hall and out the front door like I have something very important to do out there, which I do. It's called hiding. If there was a clump of bushes, I would dive into it, but I settle for tucking myself into a recessed area to the right of the doors where I'm at least out of sight of any people who might come out of them. I crouch against the wall, panting like I've just run a race and try to calm down. This is hard to do when Dahlia Brennan basically just reached into my brain, grabbed a bunch of my memories from where they were filed, mostly under crappy sex or boy acts like jerk or Libby is an idiot, threw them on the floor and told me I have to refile them under coercion, sexual assault and rape. That doesn't seem like a fun job. That's it for now. Thank you so much, Danielle. Um, so moving and so very vivid. Um, thank you. I'm going to introduce next um, Robin Doolittle, um, who is the author of Had It Coming. So Robin Doolittle is an investigative reporter whose unfounded series, published in 2017, spurred police forces across Canada to review over 37,000 cases of reported sexual assaults that they had previously dismissed as quote unquote unfounded. For this work, Robin received a Landsberg Award from the Canadian Journalism Foundation and was named Journalist of the Year by the Canadian Centre for Journalism. She previously won a Missioner Award for her reporting on former Toronto Mayor Rob Ford, who was also the focus of her first book. Robin's new book, Had It Coming, What's Fair in the Age of Me Too, has been called incisive, impeccably researched, and deeply honest, as well as, quote, a decisive snapshot of this moment in history, end quote. Um, we are so pleased to have you at Writers Fest, Robin. Welcome. Hello. Yay, the Zoom worked. It's a win. <laughs> um, thank you so much for having me uh, and for your introduction. Um, I'm going to read starting from the beginning of the book and um, not just because it's the beginning, uh, but I think it, it sets up kind of where I'm coming at with a lot of where the book goes. Um, I spend a lot of time trying to unpack what rape culture is in the book and also to get us to think about the ways that we participate in rape culture, that it's so ingrained in, in everything around us that we don't even notice it sometimes. Um, it wasn't until I was doing some of the reporting uh, mentioned around sexual assault that I even realized um, how much I had been ignorant to it uh, well into my 30s. So starting... Kobe Bryant and me. I was 18 when police in Eagle, Colorado arrested Kobe Bryant on accusations that he'd raped a woman in a hotel room. I don't remember how I heard about it, but I do remember my first thought upon learning the news. Well, what did she expect going to a hotel room with an NBA player? The woman was 19, barely a year older than I was at the time. She'd been working the front desk at a mountain lodge when Bryant checked in on June 30, 2003. The 24-year-old basketball all-star was in the area for knee surgery. He arrived late with a small entourage and asked the woman to show him around the facilities. After the tour, she escorted Bryant back to his room. He invited her in, they chatted for a bit, flirted, and when he kissed her, she kissed him back. It was flattering, she later told police, that the famous Los Angeles Lakers seemed interested in her. She was okay with the kissing. 
but then Brian started to grope and fondle her. The teenager moved towards the door, but Brian blocked her path. I try and walk to the side, and he would walk with me, she told police. That's when, she alleged, the six foot six shooting guard put his hands around her throat and squeezed, not hard enough to close her windpipe, but hard enough to make it clear that he was in control. Bryant removed his pants. He bent her over a chair. When he removed the teenager's underwear, she again protested, but he ignored her. Every time I said no, he tightened his hold around me, she told police. The woman told, people, or, the woman told police that Bryant proceeded to rape her. He did so with one hand gripping her throat while she slept. When she was eventually able to leave, Brian's t-shirt was stained with her blood. Almost immediately, the woman bumped into a friend, the hotel bellman. She tearfully recounted that Bryant had choked and raped her. A sexual assault examination performed 15 hours later revealed two one centimeter lacerations and several small tears in her vaginal region. The injuries were, quote, consistent with penetrating genital trauma. Officials also documented a bruise on her jaw. Bryant initially lied to investigators and said he'd never had sex with the teenager, but he changed his story after police indicated that they had physical evidence from the rape kit. In his new version of events, Bryant admitted that they'd had sex, but he claimed it was consensual, and in fact, she had been the one to initiate it. The ensuing media coverage trumpeted Bryant's athletic accolades, questioned the complainant's character, and minimized the severity of the allegations by sprinkling basketball references throughout stories that were otherwise about rape. On the hardwood, he often controls the court, but facing allegations of felony sexual assault by an unnamed 19-year-old woman, basketball superstar Kobe Bryant may find himself on another court where three-point plays don't matter, NBC News reported after the arrest. The headline in the Los Angeles Times reassured fans that they had reason to doubt their star's accuser. Alleged victim in Bryant case is a 19-year-old graduate of local high school who is said to be a fun-loving, who is said to be fun-loving, outgoing, and emotional. The Associated Press story painted a portrait of a man deserving of compassion. Sitting not far from the court where everything comes so naturally to him, Kobe Bryant found it tough just to speak. After waiting several seconds to gather himself, the Los Angeles Lakers guard choked back tears and his voice quivered. I'm innocent. The next year and a half brought merciless exposure for the young woman. An American supermarket tabloid, The Globe, published a front page photograph of the girl taken at her high school prom with curled blonde tendrils falling beside her cheeks and a corsage on her wrist. In the picture, she's hiked up her satin skirt, exposing a mid-thigh garter. Her full name appears in all caps alongside the headline, Kobe's accuser, did she really say no? On numerous occasions, court staff mistakenly released confidential details about her. For example, they emailed reporters transcripts of a closed door discussion about the complainant's sexual history. When it came out that traces of another man's semen had been found inside her, Bryant's defense used it to attack the woman's credibility. The woman had already disclosed that she'd had sex two days before the incident, but the defense asserted that she'd also had intercourse after the encounter with Bryant which accounted for her vaginal injuries. Her lawyer called the assertion patently false. In September 2004, prosecutors in Eagle County announced they were dropping the charges against Bryant. The victim has informed us after much of her own labored decision, deliberation, that she does not want to proceed with this trial, District Attorney Mark Herbert explained. Bryant issued an apology that contained no admission of guilt. Although I truly believe this encounter between us was consensual, I recognize now that she did not and does not view this incident in the same way that I did. The following year, attorneys for the woman and Bryant reached a civil settlement. When I was 18, I didn't know most of these details and obviously didn't care enough to find out. I felt no connection to this woman, despite the fact that she was practically my age, that I'd spent the last three years working at a hotel in my own small town that my high school girlfriends and I had taken that exact same photo in our prom dresses, that there's no question I would have been giddy if a famous athlete had flirted with me. Instead, I felt safe in my sense of superiority, confident that I'd never be so foolish or weak. I wasn't one of those girls, girls dying for attention from men, girls, girls who made the rest of us look bad. I remember talking about Kobe Bryant's arrest I always made it clear that I was one of the good ones. I got it, don't worry, I'm cool. This girl had gone to a hotel room with an NBA basketball player at night. 
What did she think was going to happen? This, all of it, is what rape culture looks like. My baseless suspicion, the sympathetic press coverage, the slut shaming, the cavalier attitude of court staff towards a set complainant, the fact that Bryant's career carried on without consequence. Let's not forget that on March 4, 2018, the first Academy Awards in the era of Me Too, Kobe Bryant won an Oscar. That's the beginning. It's kind of a bummer. Paper. But there's lots of things to be excited about and in, in, in where this conversation is going. So I'm really excited to be here with you guys to, to get into the good stuff. Yeah, thank you so much, Robin. That was incredibly powerful. And I, will, I would like to come back to your reading specifically in a few minutes. But first, I want to start out with titles because, you know, I think this is how most people first confront a book. We've got one called Had It Coming. We've got another one called He Must Like You. And um, I was really struck by the fact that you both chosen these titles that pivot on really well-worn cliches. Um, at, but they're not just cliches, they're also acts of dismissal. So they're the words that people use when they're trying to minimize bad behavior or to defend um, illegal behavior. But they're right up there with boys will be boys and all those other things that people say in a lot of cases very thoughtlessly. And I wondered why did you choose something that was so familiar, but yes, also enraging and dismissive as your titles? Um, I chose it because um, I have, I, I mean, I was writing on the subject matter, obviously, and I have two daughters and I actually had the experience of my little one uh, talking to, we were walking home from school and there was somebody else, I can't remember who said it, but it was another adult. And she'd been having some trouble on the playground um, with somebody who was, I don't know, throwing stuff out of bothering her. Um, and she was upset about it. And this other person who was walking with us said, well, he must like you. And I had been doing lots of reading. Uh, and I immediately was like, oh, don't say that to her. And and then and it, it all sort of came up in, in sort of, like a volcano in me, but that I had to hold in because I didn't, like, I knew it was a well-intentioned comment. I didn't want to explode at the person who was walking with me. And I also then faced with my sweet little kid, didn't want to say, no, he doesn't like you actually. Um, so I just, I don't even know what I said, but uh, that really struck me. And, and it struck me that I was still hearing that today, uh, you know, this maybe four years ago. So I think that was in my mind uh, and then there's a scene in the book, uh, late in the book, where Libby, who is waitressing, uh, meets a little girl who is in a similar kind of situation. She's be just been being bullied at school and Libby's serving her at the restaurant. And it's right at a pivotal scene at the end of the novel where Libby is having to decide whether to apologize to this person who has sexually harassed her in order to keep her job or not. And this is one of the moments that she suddenly, when this little kid sits there and this little kid's dad says this same stupid thing to her, that she goes back in her own mind and remembers the same thing being said to her. And it all, it helps her pull everything together to realize this is all part of the same garbage, which is rape culture. Uh, and so that, that's how the title came about for the book. Thank you. Robin? Uh, so as you mentioned, I'd spent, you know, two years or so reporting on this for the Globe and Mail um, with my unfounded series. And I had no intention of writing a book about this at the time. Um, my series started in February, 2017, and it was that fall that Me Too happened. And the thing that really uh, kind of got me uh, interested in this more was the Aziz Ansari story, um, which mm. we can talk about a little later, but if you, really quick, the, the comedian um, Aziz Ansari, there was a story that was written in this website that now seems to be defunct, where a woman is recounting a, an evening with Aziz. Um, and it seemed very much like what Danielle was writing about it, in her scene in her book, that it was an encounter that didn't go the way she wanted it to. It didn't she didn't feel good about it. She didn't want to be there. She ended up kind of going along with it just because she couldn't figure out how to get out of the situation or say no. And I thought that that just rang true for so many, um, so many things that women can relate to around the discussions we've had in Me Too. Uh, but at the time when I was reading it, I struggled with like, is this a sexual assault? Because she characterized it as a sexual assault. And I texted some of my girlfriends and we had a really good conversation about it. 
And I said something like, I feel bad for Aziz Ansari, uh, like that he's being embarrassed in this way. And my friends were like, why are you concerned about Aziz Ansari? Like Aziz is fine. Um, you know, if he didn't want to be embarrassed, maybe he should have treated her better. And it got me thinking about all of these issues. And, uh, you know, the, my friend was essentially saying that Aziz Ansari had it coming, right? And so when I was working on the book and thinking about rape culture and trying to unpack rape culture in a way that was really accessible and not, um, was hopefully not going to make people defensive if this is something that they haven't thought about before. Um, I, I kept coming back to that, the, the tropes about women and, you know, the, the Kobe Bryant's accuser, she had it coming. Um, but then turning it, that, that this is, um, this is a conversation that all of us had have, has, have had coming for a long time. Um, and that's where I, I ended up. I think my initial suggestion was he had it coming. Um, but then it was, it was to broaden more that, that society has had it coming. That's such a fantastic way of flipping the the cliche of had it coming because, you know, my mind automatically goes to she had it coming. Um, You know, the the encounter that you described with Kobe Bryant and his 19 year old um, accuser, survivor. Um, And so that's a really terrific way of sort of flipping things around and making us sort of and refracting things in a different way. Um, and this leads me to my second question, which is, you know, at the right at the beginning of your book, Robin, you say that, a quote, as a culture, we aren't very good at having nuanced, complicated discussions, end quote. And I think, Danielle, this is also a really good description of the challenge for you as a novelist, for telling stories that are gripping and appealing and yet um, are not two, boy fo- two by fours applied to the head um, and that they, they, ha- they contain subtlety and complexity. Um, and I think you're right. As our cult- in our culture, we like things to be easy. We like them to be catchy. We like to be able to slap a hashtag on them and have them go viral. Um, so how do we then discuss this very complicated series of ideas? And how do we navigate this movement if we are not fundamentally good at doing this? Right, no pressure. I know it's a small question. You have to address it in oh, you know, 10 minutes. Um, but if you could maybe make an, a start, that'd be really great, I think, for people to hear. Do you want me to go first or Danielle? Or me? Why don't okay. We alternate. So why don't you go first? Right? I think, yeah, like the the thing that I saw over and over again when I was doing this research is that um, particularly men um, were really struggling with with where they fit into Me Too and the discussions around this. And um, even men that, you know, were theoretically on board, they're kind of like, I don't know where I, like, where do I fit into the conversation? I don't know what to say. Um, I don't know if I should say anything. And um, I think as I was, a lot of this was online, you can see people, especially as I was doing book events, I saw it even more. Um, I think we need to, you know, you need to talk that stuff out. Like sometimes it's, there's sometimes you say things and sometimes you don't say things and sometimes you ask questions and sometimes you don't and sometimes you say the wrong thing. And as long as it's coming from a good place, um, I don't think you, you know, you need to be you know, pilloried for it. Um, I think uh, I think what I'm trying to do here is say that a lot of this stuff is messy and uh, it's not easy. And and I think a big part of it is acknowledging like how much of this is just ingrained in in the whole way that we live. That we've never really thought about some of these things before. And if you've just kind of opened your eyes to this stuff, um, it's not something you just suddenly unwire. Like you don't just like suddenly see rape culture, see problems everywhere, right? Like that, it comes with experience and talking through things and saying the wrong thing and making mistakes. And, you know, when I was going back through those headlines about Kobe Bryant, I'm sure if you went back to those journalists today, they would recognize the problem of calling a sexual assault complainant emotional and fun loving, right? But at the time that wasn't part of the the conversation. doesn't mean it wasn't wrong at the time, but there's a different level of someone knowing the harm that they're doing um, again, that doesn't mean that they're not, they don't have to be accountable for it in that moment. But um, the, the carefulness with which I'm answering this question is, is part of the delicacy of talking through these issues, right? Because the, the truth is that you can take a snippet of something and put it in a tweet and that's, you know, you're, you're just getting flooded with angry messages. And I, what I try to call for in the book is, um, if you care about someone uh, and genuinely, and they genuinely want to do better is give them the space to make the mistakes and and talk through these things. And um, 
you know, one really smart person that I interviewed in the book talks about, you know, what do you do with, with men who have committed harm? Um, and there's a range, right? But like, do you send everyone off to rapist island? Like, is, does that really does that really get us where we where we want as a culture? And again, there's a range of of behavior here that we're talking about. There's got to be a range of consequences. Thank you, Danielle. Um, Robin, I loved your book, by the way. So I I think it, I felt like it's such a good like people who have questions after they read my book. I feel like I might hand them yours um, yes. if they want to read more and and it's get a lot of too heavy. Here's Danielle's. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So I, I definitely I agree that I don't know the answer, but I do know that um, what's really needed is a lot of discussion. And what I deliberately set out to do with this book was to show. Um, a variety of different, uh, not a vast variety, but a few, a couple of situations specifically around consent that are, do fall into what is a murky territory for some people. Um, and Robin in her book talks about ethical, ethical violation versus a legal violation. And I wanted to kind of sit right in the middle with a couple of these. And I wanted to, with the two teenage characters, like with, with the sexual harassment in the restaurant, I think it's very clear that that's a predatory situation and that guy's in the wrong. Um, and that's more about how she handles it because he has all the power. But with these two boys, I really set out to purposely not vil villainize them, but to show that they had caused harm and to show that this was something confusing for, for all parties to sort through and to kind of give them an opportunity and they're teenagers, so obviously, the younger people can start reading and talking about this, the, the, the more conversant they'll become with the subject. And, and I certainly had no kind of preparation for this growing up. So that's, that was my, that was how I did it is that I wanted to show a very nuanced way of going through it. And then even there's a, a scene late later in the book with her, with Libby's brother, who is a very positive character overall. He's there for Libby. He's, he's caused some problems, but he's, he's a good guy. But she, he, she mentions this thing with Perry, not saying that it was her, this guy in the restaurant harassing her. And he's on the phone with her and he's like, Oh, my buddy, what did he do? Oh, he, you know, and, and he has a completely misogynist reaction to what she tells him because she doesn't know, he doesn't know that it happened to her. Uh, and then of course, when he realizes it was her and she's furious and, um, and I wanted to kind of show that's an unconscious thing. That's a, a good person who I think once it's pointed out to him, he then realizes, oh, I automatically went to assume that it's the other person's fault and that like my guy Perry is just kind of misbehaving in an endearing way as opposed to a seriously harmful way. So, you know, ultimately I don't know the solution except that I think like Robin uh, talks about in her book is more conversation and of course, my book is, is a YA novel, so more conversation amongst teens, hopefully, uh, so that they have an awareness about this and so that they have a vocabulary for it. And, uh, and so that the boys don't feel that they are um, banished to Rapist Island uh, when there are these very confusing situations and they can hopefully be avoided as well. Maybe I can just really quickly add that one of the big things that I heard from experts was that we need to talk about this at a young age um, and start talking about consent in schools and, uh, and understanding the nuances. Um, you know, teenagers, university students can recite the legal definition of consent, but like Danielle's talking about and, and the, the lines between ethical and legal consent is, are so murky and that's where the majority of sexual assault occurs. And so exploring these issues in an accessible young adult novel that deals with scenarios and actual like the thinking through those things, like that is so valuable. Like if you're a teacher, like that is um, a great learning tool, I think, to, to have those discussions and then the conversations that arise and maybe in a classroom setting. And again, it'd have to be a safe space to do it. But like, there is a discussion where you might see people be like, well, how, how is he supposed to know with this? Or well, what about this or whatnot? And, and you can talk through those things. It's not black or white every single time. It's a scenario based. And it's really about um, just trying to be a, a nice supportive person that cares about your sexual partner. Like that's kind of the, the end that I think we need to get to as a society. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You've both done, you both alluded to this 
you know, necessity for having these ongoing conversations that are subtle and non-confrontational and that allow people to misspeak and then to reconsider. Um, and Danielle, you do a beautiful job of staging some of these conversations in your novel. Um, and I wondered if you had specific thoughts about how to include more people. I mean, the three of us are sitting here as, you know, educated adult women having this conversation here, but to reach others, to reach people of all genders, of all classes, of all backgrounds, of all cultures. How do we do that work? And do you have any thoughts about how we can broaden that conversation? For me, um, <laughs> Robin might have a better idea about this, but I, for me, the first thing I do is I go and I write a book and then I hope that it catches on. Um, I also am continually talking to my teens, to my uh, I was at a book club the other night and everybody there uh, was a parent of a teenage girl. So they all read the book. They are hoping to then maybe have their daughters read the book and come back and I will go meet with them again. Um, I've also been asked like, how do you get, you know, young men to read this book? And of course that's a harder, I actually wish I could find a, a like a potentially a male YA author to write a companion book from the points of view of the other, of, of the boys in this book or one of them. Um, you can't make somebody read a book, but you can get the discussion going that other people are reading it. And I'm hoping teachers and librarians and educators will, will continue to be on this. And I just am doing whatever I can and my skill is with, with writing novels to, um, to make this more of a conversation and to continue it. So that's, yeah. Robin, what about you? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think, I think to reach young people, you can do it through schools, but even just having these conversations reflected in the media we consume and the entertainment we consumed is like so, uh, is, is making huge leaps, right? Like you are seeing this reflected on your Netflix homepage, like these very discussions in the mainstream. And I mean, I never thought about this stuff when I was a teenager, ever, yeah. ever. And so I think, I think there is lots of reason to feel um, to feel hopeful. The, the, big, the big thing that I come back to over and over again in the book is we can't look to the justice system to resolve these issues. This is a moral, ethical issue. And um, I have a feeling like the whole entire group of males about to walk through this way. So Hi. we'll see who shows up. Um, but uh, that's a big thing. It's just pushing away from the legal, bringing this conversation um, to your kind of kitchen table with your friends and family and recognizing that it's um, this is going to come from from just learning relearning all the things we know about how to interact yeah. okay thank you so much um, time is passing so quickly and I do want to ask you each a question about craft um, so uh, I'll start with you Danielle um, the opening scene in the restaurant which you deliberately did not read from um, if I is it okay if I just sort of yeah. set it up for yeah. the audience or maybe you would like to set it up for the audience but no, you go I'm gonna, I'll, sorry go ahead go ahead set no, it up no you'll be faster I bet okay um, basically um, Libby is at work there is a very powerful man who's coming to the restaurant and he is sexually harassing her and the the opening scene is just basically how she has to deal with all these very various competing pressures that are happening to her simultaneously. Um, it's, a beautiful, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible scene. It's a really, really hard scene to read, but it's also so precisely set up that I kind of wanted to diagram it because it was so um, complete and thorough. Um, and so there are these um, things that, so she has to deal with Perry and his need as a, as a patron of the restaurant. She deals with his escalating sexual harassment. Um, she has this range of responses from her coworkers, which range from being sympathetic to passive to curious to just not getting it. Um, and then a boss who is crucially supportive until she actually asks him to do something about the situation. Um, and I wonder, how did you write that scene? How did you plan it? How did you revise it? How did, how did it finally sort of coalesce in what we see in this book? Well, I worked uh, in my 20s in restaurants, so I definitely had that experience. And I, it's very easy to recall the uh, crazy stress um, of working in a restaurant and the many things that are happening all at once. And I, and I had my own incidents, many, of uh, sexual harassment as a waitress. It was just built into the job, I felt. Uh, and so for me, the scene just came very naturally like I just I think it was a very natural way to think about it that like this is a person with a ton of stuff going on and this 
one thing is at the front um, and yet she is juggling like crazy and then finally she, she just is, she's had enough and dumps a picture of sangria on him. So, um, and kind of ruins her own life in the process temporarily. I, and I, I don't, as far as writing it, I just, I think I did revise it, but the scene came out relatively clearly almost the first time because I just remember, I remember waitressing so vividly and I remember the time, some of the times that I was sexually harassed so vividly and things that happened to other friends of mine. And so I just, I just wrote it and then revised it mostly to tighten it um, was most of the, was most of it. And I actually had to also in revision, I actually made Perry a little less harsh than I had him in the beginning. Um, but that was essentially it. And then it's always layering, like pulling stuff out and putting different things in it. And that's how it goes. Okay. But essentially it was, it was from the gut. And yeah. what, what needed to be on the page was already on the page. It was in my in head. Already, yeah. Yeah. And then it was wow. just refining it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and Robin, I had a question for you too. Um, I was really uh, please, it's not the right word, but I was very interested that you started um, your reading with that very first scene with you and Kobe Bryant um, from your perspective as a very young woman on this case that happened almost a generation ago. Um, and this very personal, intimate tone sort of continues throughout the book. And um, I found it such a powerful reminder of the fact that we all have some personal awareness of sexual assault, um, even if it's only via our cultural heroes, um, and the fact that we also have this vested interest in the outcomes of sexual assault and, and rape culture. And I wondered, how did you come to the decision to include your past selves in this book? And how did you balance those past selves against the research and the issues that you're also trying to present in the book? That's a funny question, because I, I, struggled so much with how to open the book um because what I didn't want was this to just be viewed as like <laughs> an ultra feminist like burn it all down that you know there's a certain group of people that are going to read for sure but frankly those people aren't the ones that I'm like most concerned with and I wanted to give people I don't know if, if permission is the right word but just to say like I am not writing this from a holier than thou perspective. I think I have a lot of very problematic views that I'm trying to unlearn and in a constant state of unlearning. I don't even know what I don't know right now. You know what I mean? Like that, that, that understanding. And, you know, I, I mapped out um, in the book, all the different things I wanted to cover, whether it was, um, you know, un unpacking trauma, the way that, uh, trauma biologically changes your responses and, um, and, and, and is a scientific explanation for some of the behavior that sexual assault um, uh, victims uh, will experience um, that are written off as, oh, don't believe her because she didn't scream or didn't run or did, doesn't remember certain things. I, you know, I wanted to get into the law. I wanted to talk about the, the question of like, what do you do with people who have committed harm? I wanted to talk about um, the, the ways that we talk about consent and how problematic it is. And I just, how do you start that? And I thought that talking, I was actually talking with my girlfriends, which is where I go for most of my discussions. And one of them, uh, I was explaining all this, like, I don't know how to introduce this, this, big, this big concept book that, um, that isn't too preachy. And it's like, and then I recounted the Kobe Bryant thing. Like, I'm like, you know, when I was 18, that I, that's exactly what I thought. And she said, then that's how you should open it. Because I totally get it that from that. So I was like, oh yeah, obviously that makes sense. <laughs> that's where I arrived at, at Kobe Bryant. But there's other parts in the book that I talk about too. Like, for example, um, I'm, I'm recounting covering a, um, a sexual assault trial when I was doing my reporting with the Globe. And it's a horrible case, but it's a woman who got you know, she got really, really drunk. She was in the entertainment district, got separated from her friends, got into a new bar. Within 15 minutes of arriving, this uh, man carried her out of the bar, like quite literally carried her because she couldn't walk after kind of pouring vodka down her throat, brought her to a hotel, raped her. Um, just an awful story. And I remember sitting in the, it, it, he, he ended up being convicted in part because there happened to be video in the elevator of her basically asleep on the way up to the, to the floor. Um, if that video hadn't have existed, I don't know if there would have been a conviction. But um, when I was watching, looking at that trial, I was like, what is wrong with this guy? Like, how can you, like, this woman cannot talk or stand. 
like, what is going on in your brain? And then around this time, I happened to rewatch the movie, The 40 Year Old Virgin. I don't know if you remember that movie, but I mean, it's self-explanatory. It's, he's a 40 year old and he's a virgin. And uh, it, it was one of my favorite movies when I was in university and I rewatched it. And there's this scene when his friends take him out to a club to teach him how to get laid. And they say to him, find the drunkest woman. Like with, within all of us, there's a code to tackle drunk bitches is, is the quote. And I'm like, oh, I never noticed that line before and how problematic that is. And that's what I think so much of understanding rape culture is. It's like, oh, the veil goes up and you're like, oh, now I see it. Okay, thank you. Um, we do have some questions queued up. I'd like to, because you mentioned friends, I want to talk to you both about friendship because that's a sort of a, a significant theme that plays through both of your books right now. Um, Robin, your friends um, obviously play a role in the development of your ideas. You bounce, you know, you bounce thoughts off them. You, you have these sort of really invigorating discussions and then you come back and you sort of do more work. Um, and Danielle, in, in the novel, um, Libby's friend group is really cohesive and they're really emotionally present for her. It's really healthy. And it also made me think of um, another YA novel from 2016 called Exit Pursued by a Bear by E.K. Johnston, um, which is a fantastic novel in which uh, the main character, Hermione, is a rape survivor. And she has these loving, supportive parents, but also it's the friendship is what is what sustains her and gets her through this ordeal. And, um, I, you know, I talk. I, I guess I was hoping you could both share your perspectives on why these friendships are so crucial and what you might say to young women and men who might feel isolated. My first or was Robin first? I can't remember. I have Danielle, go ahead. Okay. okay. Um, I really wanted to make a point of that and I know Exit Pursued by a Bear is incredible. Um, I love that book. Also, and I also just felt like a lot of what happens in uh, YA novels sometimes, there's a lot of alienation. There's somebody by themselves. Um, Libby has a really tough home life um, in the book. And I felt that she needed those friends, honestly. And also my experience has always been that I have, I have had, I have lifelong friends who have definitely been there for me. And I really wanted to reflect that um, and to show also that being open, like I find itself in a plot device where somebody not telling anything that happened to them becomes a, a, a thing um, that everything could be solved if they only told their friends and got support. And so I, I wanted to say, no, this is somebody who does tell her friends and she does get support and they do help her through it. And I believe that friendships can be like that. And so I think, you know, being willing to talk and be open if something happens to you is a message that I wanted. And that you can have your, that you can have your group that will walk, you know, they walk around her in a formation when a video goes viral of this thing that's happened at work. And they just literally show up at her door and are like, we are here, you know, and we're walking to school, like literally around you and into school with you. And that's just something I felt strongly I wanted to do. So that's how it happened. Robin? Yeah, I mean, friends, I think, are, are, are so crucial to my life. I, I thought it was when I was researching the chapter on um, the generational differences that people have to me, too, and, and the different experiences they're having. Um, I went and interviewed Susan Brown Miller, who's wrote Against Our Will, the first big book on rape. Um, and uh, she's in New York and was talking to her at the forefront of kind of the radical feminist movement in the 70s. And she was telling me about consciousness raising groups where the women would come together and bring food and talk about these issues like rape and abortion and sex. And this was kind of the support and unpacking this and learning to understand it. And as she was describing it, I'm like, oh, that's my book club. Like, I know that I do that now. And certainly like that is where I, I talk through all the big things in my life and um, where I have the conversations, where I talked about the things I wanted to learn and understand in the book. And um, I think that is what is so devastating right now about COVID-19 is we are separated from our friends. And um, I think, you know, you ask like what messages for isolation, it's like find ways to connect to people. And maybe that's Zoom or um, like I bought a, you know, an outdoor propane heater in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, I need to be able to sit outside as long as I can um, and have friends over and sit in the yard or something. Um, 
and just finding finding ways and maybe it's online um and maybe it's in person and maybe it's a neighbor that you've never spoken to like that's been one nice thing about this is is i've gotten to know the people who live on my street better than ever before um and we will get through this and human relationships are so valuable and if you're feeling super bummed out and isolated right now like there's reason for it like don't make yourself crazy about feeling awful like it's awful right now so I know that's not maybe the most uplifting thing, but I think like giving yourself permission to feel like, no, I'm super, I feel super bummed out right now is, is an okay place to be. And uh, it's not going to last forever. I think, you know, I think that actually is kind of an uplifting thing to say, because I think you've just validated a lot of people out there. <laughs> so, um, I realized I have let this conversation slip away. It, I, we're running a little bit late. So I'm going to turn to a couple of um, viewer questions. The first one is for you, Robin. Um, how much change do you see um, if, women, if how women are treated when they report an experience of sexual abuse since Kobe, for instance? How have things, do you see how things have changed? And if so, how I mean, have they changed? Things are dramatically better from when Kobe uh, reported, but, uh, or when the Kobe incident was, which is like 2003-ish or something. Um, they're not great still. I mean, my, my Unfounded series ran in 2007, 2017, I should say. And after that series, the majority of the police services are re representing the, the country announced like sweeping changes around training, police oversight, policies, accountability, um, I, I won't know, we won't know, uh, you know, how those things from a statistical, like black and white data perspective have really impacted for a few more years. I, I'm going to go back to it, but, um, yeah, we needed to give time to kind of work through the system for statistical purposes. There's a whole bunch, they, they changed all their coding around stuff. So, um, Anecdotally, I can tell you, I still get emails every month and I haven't written about this in a long time from people asking me to look into how their case was handled. So I think there's a lot of things. Um, I think it really depends who you are. Like that's a reality uh, that, you know, are you, a, are you a, a, a pretty white woman who wasn't drunk at the time, who shows up at a big city police service? Um, are you an indigenous woman? Um, who's showing up at a smaller police service, uh, a, you know, with, a, with a, a, a white man as the, the perpetrator. I mean, I think what I found in, in my reporting on Unfounded was that there, you know, there are more than um, 1,100 police jurisdictions in the country. And the rate at which your case is handled uh, depends much more on geography than the actual allegations relative to your complaint. So, um, I don't know if that's better. I think it's probably a little bit better, but still a long way away from where where it needs to be. And um, you know, it, it's very upsetting. <laughs> that's all I can say. We have to keep on it. And um, you know, it's an issue. I'm gonna. I, I plan on tracking the rest of my career. So. Okay. Thank you. And Danielle, a question for you. Um, someone would like to know: Do you have anything to say to older women? Ah. <laughs> uh... Do I have anything to say to older women? That is, I, I was so interested in Robin's book uh, and talking and hearing from her about the generational divide, even with yes. feminists, uh, um, what you were just talking about. Um, I would say uh, that I'm about a bit confused about how to talk to older women. I, I'm Gen X. I sort of hit in the middle. I feel like my teenage daughter's super clear about a lot of this stuff. And I feel like talking with some people in the older generation, they definitely have that attitude of some of, um, you know, well, you you were, you know, you have, you have to take responsibility for your part in where you were and why you were there. Uh, and that looking at this book of mine, they would say that my character was drunk and naked in bed with a guy and what did she expect? Uh, and that, that attitude is still out there. And I, think that I hope that um, with more discussion women can look and realize that they have maybe internalized some ideas that could use a little bit of light shone on them and be open to hearing what is being said um, and I think again it's more not wanting to put people on an us and them at all but we every generation is looking at this slightly differently and I hope that we can just keep talking about it. 
Okay, conversations again. Um, I'm sorry, this is the end of our time today, but um, Danielle young Elman, author of He Must Like You and Robin Doolittle, author of Had It Coming, What's Fair in the Age of Me Too. Thank you so much for joining me today in conversation. It's been illuminating. We really appreciate your coming. Thank you for leading this. Yes, thank you. And thank you, uh, Robin, for the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the festival. Thanks, Ying, for your preparation and all your great questions. It was a pleasure. Thanks to all three of you. That was a conversation I would have uh, enjoyed to continue for hours on end. So thank you so much to Robin, Danielle, and Ying. A reminder that Robin and Danielle's books are available for purchase at Novel Idea. And thanks again to Novel Idea to Penguin Random House Canada, uh, Re Penguin Random House Canada Young Readers. And thank you for joining us and for supporting Kingston Writers Fest. Be sure to check out our website, kingstonwritersfest.ca and our social media at Kingston Writers Fest for dates and times and, and to register for some of our other wonderful author events. We'll see you soon. Bye for now. <laughs>